All right, hello. Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Anisha Dargalkar, and I'm on behalf of Focus, I would like to thank everyone for coming to tonight's presentation, which is going to be about vaping, the dangers of vaping, and what every parent needs to know. Um, so I was in a position just to give that information out, and I get um, information from the American Medical Association every day. I just read an article today that was from, from the Associated Press published yesterday, and it cited national survey data, which found that 28% of high school students and 11% of middle school students said they used e-cigarettes in the past month. So that's large percentages. This translates to 5.3 million users nationally compared to 3.6 million last year. So this is a problem that affects every school across the country and it's actually on the rise. Um, so that's why I feel this evening is so important and I thank you all for coming, I appreciate it. So we're gonna kind of do with this format and I'm gonna just kind of explain it. We're gonna be having individual, individual presentations from five esteemed speakers who will review the concepts of vaping and e-cigarettes that are within their expertise. And then we're gonna have a question and answer session where the speakers will serve as panelists to answer any and all questions you may have. Um, we'll be recording the presentation portion of the night, and then we'll turn off the recording for the question and answer um, portion so everyone feels comfortable asking whatever they want to ask. And we hope to have everything wrapped up by 8.30. So um, I'm going to now introduce Dr. John Sandville, our superintendent, and he's going to introduce our five speakers. Thank you. I thought that I did like a rounding <laughs> It's, uh, first of all, I thank you all for coming out, and it's, it's, it's not a, a, a large crowd, but I'm hoping for an enthusiastic crowd. Um, I, I appreciate everyone coming out. We were, we were having a, a sidebar here in the, uh, a, a, about vaping and just about uh, folks coming out, and our lives are busy, and so it's, you know, it's a commitment for our presenters to come out and also for our um, folks in the audience to come out, and I appreciate that. And I, I think that uh, it's it's important for us when we come out now and think about this. Is that this is vaping and e-cigarettes, however you want to uh, characterize it or, or label it. Uh, the statistics are sobering. They're, they are sobering worldwide, nationwide, locally, and for us, it's an issue. It's, it would be naive of us to think that. Uh, our kids aren't vaping, they are. It is, it is happening. And so uh, that, that we're on the front end before there is a tragedy in our community. Uh, because if we have this event after a tragedy, the audience, it's full, right? So the, you don't know where uh, it makes a difference for everyone coming out. The, as I said, the crowd might be small, uh, but it's important that you don't know which one of us can make a difference uh, for, for one of the children in our community, or an adult for that matter. So uh, with that, uh, let, me, let me introduce our, our five presenters and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to listen to that. So uh, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Gaurav, Gaurav Patel, uh, board certified pulmonary and critical care physician, uh, having done his fellowship at Texas Tech University. He also completed a sleep medicine fellowship at the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Patel joined Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Associates located in Westchester, Pennsylvania uh, in August of 2016 and has been a partner there uh, ever since. He is also the proud parent of two sons uh, right here in Unionville, Chatsworth, the Copson Elementary. I think the Copson is pretty well represented here. <laughs> so. Uh, so, so thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, we also have uh, Kelly Halpert. Uh, Mr. Kelly's right there. Also a parent in the district, another Picopson, uh, another Picopson person. Uh, Kelly is a pediatric nurse practitioner at the pulmono pulmonology department at New Moore's uh, AI DuPont uh, for the Hospital for Children. And again, as a, as a parent here in the district. So, so thank you so much for coming, Kelly. Uh, Lindsay Smith, there we go, Lindsay Smith, a uh, public health educator at Chester County Health Department uh, with a master's degree in public health and a concentration in community health, chair of the Chester County Tobacco Free Coalition, and Lindsay has also been coming out and doing sessions with our seventh graders right here at the middle school, so, so thank you for that. Uh, we have Christine Storm. Uh, Christine uh, has been a member of Karen's Education Department, Karen 
Foundation Education Department since 2004. She's a Regional Director of Education and is responsible for ensuring that quality education, prevention, and intervention services are provided to school systems and youth agencies in the greater Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. regions. Christine holds a teaching degree from the University of Scranton and a public health degree from Westchester University. And and finally, uh, Sarah Graydon is a social worker at, uh, at Unionville High School. Sarah works with students, staff, and families to provide prevention, intervention, and crisis response services. Uh, before joining the Unionville Child Sports School District, uh, Sarah was a, a school-based therapist in the William Penn District in Delaware County. And uh, prior to working with schools, she was a project manager, manager at the University of Pennsylvania smoking treatment program uh, where she educated physicians on smoking cessation best practices and ran community-based uh, cessation programs in philadelphia uh, sarah is active in her community and she's currently serving her first elected term as council member at swathmore borough she has her bachelor's degree from american university and her master's from the university of chicago sarah is, is a licensed clinical social worker in the commonwealth and so we have a really talented, skilled group of presenters, and so I'm going to get out of the way and let them do their thing. So I think we're going to be with Dr. Patel. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, and um, as uh, Dr. Sam would say, is that uh, this is an enthusiastic crowd rather than a number of people around. That's the most important thing. And I feel proud myself and thank you, Anisha, for, um, you know, uh, I'm here. So I'm a pulmonary physician and uh, I finished my fellowship in 2016 and I joined the Westchester and I'm working at the Chester County Hospital for four years. And obviously, is, uh, I'm a proud parent of uh, two sons and as well as my two nephews. One is in the middle school and one is in the high school. So my whole family is here and that's a wonderful thing. And uh, I'm planning to present uh, the effect of um, e-cigarettes and the vaping onto the lung particularly. So I focus only on the lung area and then we have other experts that will cover the other things. So the term called Evali. So uh, the Evali is e-cigarettes or vaping associated lung injury. So this is a very new term even for pulmonologists and as well as to all other physicians that we use the word evali. So from pulmonary point of um, there is a sudden or long-term respiratory illness that can be severe and life-threatening. Vaping is a process. So vaping has a Basically, in the e-cigarettes or in the vaping, there are uh, three things. One is a cartridge, other one is an atomizer, and the third is a battery. So the atomizer is the main trigger thing. So either it can be triggered by your inspiratory flow when they are trying to inhale something that will trigger the atomizer, or by clicking that will also um, trigger the atomizer. And with the battery power, this cartridge contains the liquids and this liquid will fall as on the drops on the atomizer and it forms the vaping. And once this vaping forms, it will inhale into the person's lung. In, within the last one year, all over the United States, about 1,200 cases are reported for this Evali. And these are the life-threatening cases and at least uh, I treated a very severe case into the ICU uh, six weeks ago and as well as at least three other cases that have a significant effect on the lung. I will show you the pictures here. And 70% uh, male are affected and 80% of this whole uh, male population about ages less than 35 years. And exact pathology is unknown, no evidence of infection. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So we want to make sure this is not an infection, this is not a, any disease process, this is not a viral infection, 
this is not a fungal infection. So that we are trying to prove that this is not a usual pulmonary infection and ultimately there is no any uh, evidence that found that this is not a disease related process and we have a specific evidence uh, by the history particularly then we conclude that probably what we are dealing with evaluate. So the risk factors is that key factor is use of the e-cigarettes or similar products Majority report is using the THC that is about 75 to 80%, 40% both and 15% nicotine. And how the THC market is pushing, sometimes it is very scary because in, in my office when I saw all the asthma patients, COPD patients, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or the fibromyalgia patients or uh, psychosocial uh, problems and uh, musculoskeletal problems, the whole things are pushing towards this side, either medical marijuana, THC, and everybody has a false sense of security that if I take this one, I will be getting better. That kind of a market is pushed uh, towards this side. So we know that how they are marketing the products, very aggressive marketing. Mean duration of the symptoms is uh, anywhere between six days to the two months. Um, and symptoms most common is a cough, fever, shortness of breath, chest pain, weight loss, nausea, vomiting. So the combination of the respiratory system as well as the gastrointestinal system is very common. Um, and 33% of patients end up on the mechanical ventilation uh, into the ICU. And as I explained to you, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So if you're looking here, if I have to just educate you about the simple X-ray. Uh, if you are look on the top left A side, uh, so generally the X-ray is, we are still living in a black and white era. Uh, and uh, the air looks black, muscle looks white and the bone looks also white. So if you look at on the top left, the lungs uh, where the air is a black, and if you look at on the upper part of the lung, how nice and clean looks onto the upper part of the lung. But if you look at more carefully into the lower part of the lungs, there are a lot of white opacities. And if you compare it with the B, then you pretty much figure out that a lot of uh, white opacities onto the right side and that is completely abnormal x-ray and these are the last three images C, B, E are the CAT scan images and if you look at it normally onto the yeah so this is a normal lung look like into the CAT scan and if you look at here these are all inflammation and the damage to the lung and this is a significant inflammation into the lower part of the lung. And if you look at here, this is a sagittal section and where you can able to see that one, this is a significant damage to the lungs. <coughs> treatment and precautions, antibiotics, generally the two main treatment what we are giving is antibiotics and to the steroids. Uh, antibiotics is to cover the infection and steroids to the healing uh, and to prevent the further inflammation into the lung. We also give the oxygen supplementation and the supportive therapy. Uh, and sometimes when patients are so severe, we have to keep them into the ICU and we have to put them onto the mechanical ventilation on, or onto the life support system. This is a reportable disease by the CDC. And currently, we suggest to avoid wrapping products by the youth, young adults, pregnant women and adults who do not currently use the tobacco products. Uh, there are recommendations for the public while this investigation is ongoing. If you are concerned about this specific health risk, consider refraining from using e-cigarettes. Regardless of the ongoing investigation, anyone who uses e-cigarette products should not buy these products off the street. That is the number one thing. Uh, and, and should not modify e-cigarettes products or add any substance to these products that are not intended by the manufacturer. Because one of the other thing is that propylene glycol. This is also one of the agents they are putting in the cartridge. This is a vehicle agent. 
and this propylene gly glycol is converted into the formaldehyde and acetaldehyde. And this formaldehyde and acetaldehyde is a main carcinogens. Uh, and we do not know the long-term effects. And I'm sure you know that in 1930s or 1940s, uh, during that time, the, how the cigarette become very famous. They say those who are men, they can smoke. So after that, the whole year I was smoking, and in 1965, general surgeon uh, will uh, those bring that the, how the negative effect of the cigarettes onto the overall health is the same thing. We have a very short duration. This is only few years. We do not know what is the long-term effect with these chemicals with the nicotine combination. Regardless of the ongoing investigation, e-cigarette products should not be used by youth, young adults, pregnant women as well as the adults who do not currently use the tobacco products. If you use e-cigarette products, monitor yourself for the symptoms, any cough, new onset of cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, coughing up blood, and promptly seek medical attention if you have concern about your health. CDC and FDA will continue to advise and alert the public as more information become available. Adult smokers who are attempting to quit should use evidence-based treatments including uh, counseling and FDA-approved medication because the one of the big thing is that, oh, I am a cigarette smoker, how about that I can switch to the e-cigarette or the vaping? Uh, that's not the current standard of care or the guideline as a personally pulmonologist. I do not advise any of my patients if they are smoking. I follow the standard smoking cessation guideline including the medication and the nicotine patch. But I do not advise them to go to switch on to the e-cigarettes or vaping or anything. That's not how the standard of care right now. So what they are talking about is if you are concerned about harmful effects from e-cigarette products, call your local poison control center uh, and we encourage the public to submit detailed reports of any unexpected tobacco or e-cigarette related health products to the safetyreporting.hhs.gov. So I think uh, this is a very important, even though we are also learning as a pulmonologist um, uh, what kind of uh, effects into the lung, how long, how long we need to treat with the steroids or the antibiotics. So these are also a learning curve for the pulmonologist too. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, you know, as much as uh, all of our youths, adults who can avoid these products, that will be a good thing. Thank you so much.
what exposures have they had to infectious processes? It's just as Dr. Patel was saying, it's an, um, a diagnosis of exclusion. So we need to make sure that there's not something infectious that could be causing these symptoms. And the symptoms are a little bit vague and very viral seeming. So we always think, oh, it's just a virus, it's just a virus. So we have to dig a little bit deeper. Um, we do a very intense social history and talk about exposures to vaping, to cigarette smoke, um, any type of nicotine. We dig a little bit deeper and we find out, okay, a, a lot of the adolescents are open about this once we talk to them about the severity of it and um, what, we're, what we're thinking and what we expect for them. Um, so they're very open. They tell us, okay, these are the products that I use and this is where I got them. And, you know, we want to know, are they making nicotine? Is it the flavored, the unflavored? Um, have they used THC as well? Where are they getting the products? Are they um, homemade or manufactured products? Everything we try and get, we get out of them. Um, obviously, we do a physical exam and assessment of their oxygen levels. And interestingly, they, they're pretty much normal. They're almost always clear lungs. Oxygen levels are almost always normal. Um, but when we stress them a little bit, you know, they say that, well, when I go to the bathroom, I get a little bit shorter breath. Going up a flight of stairs, I get shorter breath, and that was not typical for me. Um, again, we're going to rule out all infectious processes, send a couple labs, we try and get a chest x ray. A lot of times it doesn't show up on chest x ray. So the x ray might be normal or just a little bit off, but nothing glaring at you saying this is a big related lung injury. CT scan has picked up all of our cases at this point. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot, a couple of the kids who have come in with significant weight loss, they were getting worked up for their GI complaints, and they would do a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis and catch the bottom part of the lungs, and that's where we said, oh, that's not normal. We do a full CAT scan of the lungs and we find all of the changes. Um, the treatment plan and follow-up steroids, so we do treat with antibiotics, especially during the rule-out phase of everything. Uh, but typically they don't respond to antibiotics because it's not necessarily a um, bacterial process. So we give them steroids. The, to the dose and the treatment course really depends on their severity of symptoms and how they're improving um, throughout their stay. Uh, the kids in the ICU obviously get a higher course. They're treated for a long time and then we slowly move them off. Uh, but at some of the other kids who are seeing a little bit less severe, they might be a short. We want to do a full evaluation of their oxygen levels and their lung function before they go home. So we do a six minute walk, which is a very self exploratory test. They walk for six minutes. Uh, we kind of monitor how far they've gone, um, their oxygen levels, their heart rate. And what we found with that is with the, they're fine when they're laying in bed and oxygen levels are all good, but if they're walking around for a couple things are starting to decrease. So with that, um, we do the lung function tests and check the diffusion. So just basically checking that the oxygen we're breathing in is able to get into the bloodstream so it can get to where it needs to go to function, to help us function fluidly. Um, and what we found is that that is often um, abnormal. So it explains why with activity and with exertion, they're not able to maintain their oxygen and it also explains the inflammation that's going on in their lungs. Um, so we ask them to come back for ongoing monitoring, making sure that the symptoms get better because we don't know the process, we don't know the course of this disease process. So um, some of the kids that we saw early summer have come back to follow-ups and their lung function is improving, it's almost normal. We haven't repeated CAT scans yet just because we expect that the changes wouldn't have fully resolved at this point. So right now we're trying to do the, the less of the two things that test it. Some things that we um, kind of learned and thought about along the way, we're trying to get psychology and adolescent medicine involved with these patients early on, uh, just so they can get a better evaluation of whether there is a nicotine addiction or a THC addiction, um, stressors that might be triggering these habits, and just for some uh, and then the treatment for nicotine withdrawal. So there were some patients early on 
they were doing a lot of vaping, they were more severe in the ICU, and they were just so agitated, and as a pediatric specialist, we don't think about nicotine addiction. So it's one of the things that we have kind of thought about, and Dr. Patel was talking about you know, offering patches and um, something to treat the acute withdrawal. That's all I have. Um, Chester County Health Department. I'm a public health educator, so I go into the schools anywhere in Chester County and do prevention programming. Um, a lot of it has been middle school. Um, this year, the high school programming has picked up, and then when I chat with parents, they're like, why aren't you in elementary school? <laughs> so if those requests start to come in, we will uh, very gladly fulfill them. Um, as you can see here, vapes come in all different sizes, shapes, and colors. It's kind of a confusing industry now. So I thought we would start with passing some around, okay? So you guys can see them. Um, so I know a lot of us hear about the jewel, okay? So I'll pass one around. You can see some jewel pods. I have to say um, it looks like one leaked out. I don't know if it was mango or creme brulee, but one of them leaked, okay? <laughs> so don't open the baggie. But um, you'll even here, um, whatever student had this jewel um, etched into the side of it so it was identifiable. A lot of students are sharing vapes. Okay, that is something that we want to keep in mind. Um, so if we don't have our flu shots yet, now would definitely be the time to do that. So I'll start this, uh, I'll start the jewel here. Okay. And um, so jewels are a pod vape, okay? I don't want to say back in the day, but a few years ago, you know, if you have like a tank or a vape pen, you take the e-juice, the e-liquid, and you, you put it in there. So there's different concentrations, there's different flavors and things like that. So let me pass one of those around. This is just a sample of the actual e-juice. Now with the jewel, the pods are already in there. So they're pre-filled pods or cartridges in a variety of flavors. There's mango, fruit punch, and um, creme brulee in there. Of course, those are supposed to be coming off the shelves, but the mint flavor and that ball will still be around, so we can assume a lot of jewel users will just switch to what is available like mint. Okay? Well, I've only got a couple more. Okay. But I just want to show you a variety. Um, this is the fix, okay? It looks very similar to a jewel. Um, I mean, very similar. This one happens to be kind of like a charcoal gray. It's a little bit less expensive. In this area, um, you know, Chester County is the wealthiest county in Pennsylvania, so it's not surprising that we see some of the more higher-end products like Jules. But um, this is also another type of e-cigarette or another type of vape pen called the Fix. And then last one I'm going to pass around is the Soren. This is kind of like that multicolored chrome one. This is another pod vape. This is just one shape that the Soren comes in. I think I have another picture of some other ones. But some of, of them are more rectangular and almost look like little credit cards, like very thin, very sleek. Again, all different sizes, shapes, and colors. Okay, these obviously were all confiscated from students at various schools. <laughs> I lined up with them. Okay, sorry. So, um, like I said, I'm a public health educator um, for the county, so I travel anywhere in Chester County to do school Thank programming, you. parent programming, outreach. Um, for the past six and a half years, I've chaired the Chester County Tobacco Free Coalition. Um, I put a bunch of our info out on the table, including a um, little packet called the Vape Talk from the American Lung Association. They just came out with that. It's how to talk to your kid about vaping. So some nice kind of key points there. Conversation starters are in that handout, as well as some of our coalition supplies like our Quick Kids. November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And in just two weeks, it's the Great American Smoke Out or Vape Out, depending on how we're going to market that. And our little um, quick kick baggies are back there. Um, for a kid, it would probably just look like there's some fun, you know, like gum and candy and little lemony packets for hydration and stuff. But um, all the information in the quick kits are like the best, like 2019 apps, My Life, My Quit, which is a team resource, um, the PA quit line, if you're over the age of 14, you can call that. So there's a whole bunch um, back there on the table right outside the auditorium. You can always go to 
our website. Um, what's nice about the coalition is that half of us, like myself, do the prevention piece. We'll come out and talk to people. And then the other half are actually the, the cessation providers. So they do um, complete free treatment. Okay, and that's all over Chester County, which is great. So um, very easy to use website if you need someone specific contact info with all of that. Okay? So nicotine is a super addictive drug and also a gateway drug. And um, you know, you can take drugs in different forms. Nicotine is one that you can smoke, vape, or chew. Okay? So we have our traditional tobacco, um, hookahs are still very popular. We obviously have our smokeless tobacco. What we're talking about today is vaping. But it is um, also called ENDS, E-N-D-S, if you've seen that in different articles. It's an electronic nicotine delivery system. Okay, so not an alternative, um, or not like a nicotine replacement therapy. It's not a quick device. It's just a part of big tobacco. Okay? So, this is just, oh, thank you. <laughs> this is just a nice little example here. This is a snippet um, from the CDC. They came out with a great toolkit last year as well. So they have some nice images that you can use in literature that um, is very like family and parent friendly. But if you look over at the far right, we've got the, uh, the disposable e-cigarette. So the first electronic cigarette, what does it look like? Yeah, regular cigarette. Yeah, okay, same size and shape, all right, no fun, no flavor, okay, very boring for current adult smokers. Okay, over time the market has completely changed. So we now have electronic pipes, electronic hookahs, there's different vape pens and different tanks and mods. Um, mods are larger in size and larger in strength. And then of course the pod vapes are what we're seeing a lot of the youth using. So, um, and that's really what I've been passing around for the, the Jewel, the Soren, the Fix, those are all pod vapes. So you have the little pre-filled cartridge that you just put right in and you're ready to go. They sell them in packs, you know, they don't want your pod to get low. Okay, they sell them in packs, so you got another one ready to go, ready to put in there. Okay? So something that we can be confusing is all the different names. Okay, electronic cigarettes, that's kind of like almost the old school term <laughs> now, or e-cigarette for short. Um, vaping is what it is, there's all these different things you can vape, just like smoking, there's different, you know, products, different brands that you can smoke. So when we talk about um, the Juul, that, that is still vaping. Jeweling is vaping. Okay, it's just a brand that got very big very fast, so using that specific product is called Jeweling. But really any of these names over here on the left represent some sort of vape device or one of those electronic nicotine delivery systems. Okay, and this is kind of covered um, earlier, but you know, they are electronics, there's a battery in there, and that liquid nicotine, either from the pod or, you know, you put it in the tank, that gets heated and steamed into an aerosol, okay? So when I go and talk with kids, what do they, what do they say? They're like, oh, it's, you know, it's just water and it's vapor. You know, who's heard that before? That's, that's what we all get. So it's not water, it's the liquid form of the drug, nicotine, and it's, it's not vapor, it's an aerosol. So we always reiterate with kids, you know, it doesn't matter if you're smoking or vaping, what are we supposed to be breathing in? It's supposed to be oxygen. That's really, you know, a very basic thing that we kind of start out with when we get to class and talk to the kids. So this is just an example of, um, you know, a vape that has a tank there versus the pod, okay? You can see where that pod is. It's also smaller in size as well. These are a lot smaller than like the tanks and the mods, those are a little bit bigger. You tend to see more adults using those other products, and we're really seeing the kids um, use the products that I passed around. Okay, so yeah, so who's this being marketed towards? Obviously a younger audience for sure. We see kind of like an apple juice reference at the top left. Okay, some jewel pods there. Um, in the center there, that's a baby pink fix. I passed around like a charcoal color one. So they're, you know, in all different colors and styles, you know, to kind of, you know, attract anybody really. Um, apple, peach, sour, strawberry, melon, sour. Those are some more sorts. I passed around one of a very similar shape, but those are the, um, the Soren drops. 
And of course, even you know, a lot of a lot of candy references. And I know you guys, you know, have been seeing in the news as well, like gummy bear flavor, you know, things like that. So it's definitely being marketed towards kids. But um, something that we reiterate is, you know, here in Pennsylvania, how old do you have to be to go purchase nicotine? You have to be 18. Um, hopefully soon 21. Our neighbors in Jersey and Delaware have done, you know, the Tobacco 21 a, a while ago. So hopefully Pennsylvania will be doing that soon. It's kind of like halfway there. So that's always something that we reiterate as well. And even if you are across the street at the high school and you're 18, are you allowed to have drugs at school? Allowed to use them at school, sell them at school? No. So all things that we, you know, kind of cover in programming when we talk to the kids. You know, and it's like these little light bulbs go off. Like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. But just, you know, those little reminders. Okay? So I just pass one of these around, but even just kind of reference there. Jewels are a lot smaller, and obviously with the pod, they're a lot easier to hide. So, you know, backpacks, or even schools that are doing checks, you know, kids will put like a rubber band on their arm and slip it in because no one's like checking in their shirt. Okay, so they're, you know, getting really creative with how to hide these products. Um, a lot of kids have figured out that a possession charge isn't so great, so they kind of stash them around school. Okay, so no one's really hands-on with it, so they're kind of in hiding a little bit. But this is so tiny, it's very easy to do. Um, like I mentioned earlier, jeweling is vaping. Okay, that's a question that comes up all the time with the kids. Sometimes they think that it's like a little different than... Well, I'm jeweling, so it's okay. Jeweling's vaping, and it's vaping a lot of nicotine. <laughs> so over on the right, that's just another little snapshot um, that the CDC actually has in their toolkit. So you can get, you know, jewel pods in, in different amounts, and, you know, some of them have as much nicotine as a whole pack of cigarettes. So this is a generation that grew up, you know, primarily in non-smoking environments. We really don't think that they're going to go home and, smoke a whole pack of cigarettes, that's highly unlikely. But unfortunately, they are going home and they do like a jewel pot over the weekend. And that's a lot of nicotine, um, that's a lot of addiction. And something that we need to focus on, um, like it was mentioned, is what do we do with the withdrawal? <laughs> you know, because that's happening in school. You know, if they jewel on the bus or they're vaping before class, you know, that withdrawal's happening during the school day. This is from the NIH. This is just kind of uh, like a national uh, snapshot for vaping. So eighth grade, a little over 17%. Of course, it really jumps there for 10th grade and 12th grade. Um, just to kind of look at that um, light green color, if we go over to just flavoring, about 25% of the 10th graders there in that green, you know, they think that they're just vaping flavor. So there really is a lot of misconception there about the fact that this is a liquid form of a drug. It happens to be very toxic and very potent. Only about a quarter of a teaspoon of liquid nicotine is all it takes to poison a family pet or a little kid at home. These items are very colorful. They smell like candy and food. It's not surprising that poison control calls have gone up by thousands of percentage points. Um, I think this is almost where I'm ending. This is our current um, Chester County data. It's actually from 2017 because it's every other year and currently the 2019 PEDS is being done right now. So this is technically our, more, our uh, most current info. But that is the, um, the completely anonymous behavioral youth survey that goes out every other year to every other grade. And they do that so it's the same cohort of students. So the 2017 10th graders are the current senior high school class that are taking the 2019 case, if that makes sense. Okay, so this is a snapshot of all of Chester County. Each school district has their own individual data. I'll just go through this really quick. Um, for 30-day use, so did you vape in the past month? Okay, um, almost 22% in 10th grade, 34% in 12th grade. You see that little star there? Let me turn it to like a little crown base because that actually means we are above state average here in Chester County. Ooh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> in Chester County for, um, for our high school seniors vaping. So not something we want to be above state average for. But what is interesting, and you know this is coming up, is if you have you know, the liquid form of another drug like THC, you can vape that. 
as well. So if you kind of toggle down to, yes, I gave to the cat 30 days, what was it? Was it marijuana? We're actually above state average for all of high school here in Chester County for vaping other substances. So just a reminder, you know, nicotine is always going to gateway drug. It's not surprising that with the increase of vaping, we're also seeing, you know, additional drug use as well. And, you know, unfortunately, above state average here. Um, just some resources, again, those are out in the lobby. Um, all of our info is on the Chester County Tobacco Free Coalition website, where it's actually just a page off of the Health Department's website. My Lifeline Quit is a newer um, teen app and you know a hotline and, and website that is, is really useful for kids that need it. And again, the Quit Line and then um, that information from the American Lung Association. I have printed copies outside. Just keep in mind if you take one, I think there are two or three pages, so just make sure that you get. substance use disorders and co-occurring disorders. Um, Karen also invests heavily in prevention. So we are an organization that goes from prevention all the way through to hopefully recovery for life. And I've worked for Karen for a very long time now in our student assistance program. Were you going to talk at all about SAP? Do you want me to highlight that? Okay, so for those of you who don't know what SAP is, it stands for Student Assistance Program, and every um, public school in the state of Pennsylvania is mandated to have a SAP team. And that's a team of trained professionals. They go through this three-day training and they get certified to be able to accept um, referrals of concern from the school community. So this is a resource for parents. This is confidential and it's non-disciplinary. So if you have a child and you are concerned about something in their behavioral health, maybe something related to their mental health or something related to substance use, you can get in touch with the team, and there's one at every elementary, middle, and high school, and they can get you guys resources, okay? It's not meant to put your family business out there that's going to stay where that is. So I work to support that work um, in the job that I do. And um, in all the years that I've done this job, um, things have changed. And whereas, you know, a lot of times when kids decided they first wanted to experiment with the drug, it's always been alcohol, nicotine, or marijuana. No matter what age the parents in here are, when you were in high school, it was alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana. But those drugs, especially marijuana and um, nicotine, have changed. And now what we're finding is that the entry into the world of drugs, if a kid is interested in trying something, does tend to be vapes now. So it's very important that we're here talking about this. My portion of what we're going to talk about today is more, okay, now what do we do? How do we identify if our kids are doing this, and then how do we help them? And I've found in doing these presentations the last couple of years, it started as more prevention, and now I'm having more and more parents coming and saying, my kid got in trouble at school. They got the discipline. Now what do I do? Okay, so that's what I want to focus on a little bit. So how do we identify if our kids are involved with this? Um, sometimes you get a call from the school that they have been caught doing this, that, or the other thing, and it becomes very apparent. Um, it's so challenging as a parent um, to be able to pick up on all of these things. So here's some of the visible signs and symptoms that could indicate that a child is vaping nicotine products. Um, unexplained sweet scent, right? So if you're a male child's bedroom smells like mango. You know, sometimes girls, it's a little easier to hide, but, you know, if we're smelling that kind of thing, it's a little odd. Um, pens and flash drives that are not pens and flash drives. That's what is so um, uh, attractive about this. Like, this vaping epidemic, it hits on everything that is attractive to kids. Fun devices, they're super techy, um, they're easy to conceal, fun flavors, you get a little buzzy head rush, you can do tricks with the vapor, there's all sorts of stuff online that you can watch, YouTube videos to see how to do that. And it's the peer pressure and the culture around this is huge, it's a lot to be up against. Um, but I always do like to focus on social norming, more kids are not vaping than are. 
So please walk away with that information. Most kids are making really good choices, okay? Um, so, dry mouth. This is very drying, okay? So increased thirst could be an element of this. Nose bleeds. A kid that was generally like maybe a coffee drinker or sort of into caffeine and is now not, it can cause a, an increased sensitivity to caffeine, which is a little strange. Um, glassy eyes. And you might start seeing, you know, some paraphernalia, odd chargers, but you're not sure, like, where did that charger come from? That's not an iPhone charger. What is that? And then I don't want to forget to talk about the signs of THC vaping. Uh, it's not just what we're finding in, you know, the electronic nicotine delivery systems. Um, when schools are confiscating devices now, they have to test what is this liquid, okay? And um, just so you know, on average, when kids are smoking marijuana, so they're smoking the leafy, flowery green stuff, um, the levels of THC in the cannabis plant have been engineered over the last decades to be more potent and powerful than ever. So back when some folks were maybe um, in high school in the 80s, the average THC amount in the cannabis plant was only like 1 to 3%. It was in like the three to four percent in the 90s. Now the average is about 14 percent. So if a kid is smoking marijuana now, that's the average potency level. But when we're talking about what can be vaped, oils, waxes, these are THC concentrates. So we're talking way above that, anywhere from 40 to almost 100 percent THC. So the average, I would say, is somewhere around 60. So we're talking about a very powerful drug. And with a lot of the lung injuries, they're saying, you saw some of the stats, a lot of it, they're saying that these patients were vaping THC. And that is because um, it's difficult to, to manufacture THC oil, and there's a giant black market for it. So people are getting, you know, small amounts of THC oil and cutting it with other stuff. And one of the things that they're finding are these, like, thickening agents like vitamin E acetate. That is really concerning. So it's a mixed bag, and people don't know what they're ingesting when they're using these products. They're so much easier to get away with because the, you smoke <coughs> marijuana, there's a potent smell. This, not so much, okay? And you can use it on, off, on, off, all throughout the day rather than having to have a session with it, okay? So we're going to see bloodshot eyes with these products, even like you would for someone that was high under the influence of, of the marijuana plant. Uh, dry mouth and thirst, increased appetite, just like we would see for someone smoking marijuana. Um, shifts in behaviors and mood. So we're going to start to see possibly some of those classic early signs and symptoms of substance use. Um, hanging out with a new group of friends, dropping out of activities that used to be important, possibly some um, behavior and attitude changes at home, getting secretive, getting a little bit volatile. Um, all of those things we could start to see happen, getting really defensive. Um, and then paraphernalia. Again, we're looking for things that just look out of the ordinary. Okay? And then we need to be asking questions about what we say. And it's very easy to hide devices, um, like Lindsay was saying. Uh, so, but I want to make sure that you guys know that there are products that are designed to hide these for kids. So I was presenting at a school a couple weeks ago and they said that these sweatshirts were like kind of popular last year. It's sweatshirts where the actual strings are vapes. And then, just so you know, they sell watches now. Um, that look like a, an Apple Watch, but the top pops off, and that's a vape. They have one that's an asthma inhaler, okay? So it would look just like an asthma inhaler, but it's a vape, okay? So everything you guys could think of. There's one that's a key fob, so someone could just have that, and you press a button, and the, the part that you vape out of pops off. So we have to be really vigilant because it's sneaky, right? It's pretty easy to get away with. So what do we do if we suspect use? And as a parent, I always say, please trust your gut. If something about your child doesn't feel right, listen to that. Um, and it's very possible when you confront them and ask them about it, they're going to lie to you. That is just common, okay? Give them a chance to be honest. If something doesn't feel right, it is your right to investigate. So you're gonna take action immediately. You are going to search their bedroom, search their backpack, it's not invasive, because we're not saying to do this for no reason. We're saying you're seeing signs and symptoms of concern. You have the right to investigate. And as a parent, that's your job. So you're going to ask them if they're using and why. So it's our, um, basically as parents, 
out of fear and sometimes anger and disbelief, we go right sometimes to yelling and you're grounded forever and you're never going out again and blah, 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 never giving you money again. But there's often reasons behind why kids are doing this and it's really important to identify that because that might let you know that this child might need some help, okay? So if you find out that your child is vaping THC oil because they have incredible social anxiety and this is helping them with that, this is a kid that might need counseling services. And here's something else, if you put, so we investigate further, we reiterate your stance, I do not want you using these, they are unsafe, they are unhealthy, I want better for you, and you put consequences in place for that behavior, the hallmark of addiction is continued use to spike negative consequences. So if you have tried the punishment thing, maybe they've gotten in trouble at school, you've taken things away, you've made them write a paper for you, you've grounded them from friends, if they continue to do this, it might let you know they need more help than, than just the punishment. They might need counseling or something like that. Uh, one of the things that you can do when you first catch a child and they say, this was a one-time thing, I don't need help with this, is you can sit down with them and create like expectations and then what they're going to agree to if they break those expectations again. That's a joint sharing power thing that parents can do together. And if things are still not improving, and you're not sure what's going on, and you're not sure how serious this is, you might need to seek out the help of a professional, okay? And there are great resources out there, um, and that's something that the school student assistance program might be able to help you out with. And you can get help from a treatment organization or counseling organization for yourself. When we're talking about just, um, if we're just talking about nicotine cessation support, there are a lot of things out there now. When it comes to um, vaping, what we are finding is that the level of nicotine dependence can be so much higher for these kids than it ever was when kids were smoking. Um, so we have a program that we run, it's free for schools, and it's called Project Connect, and it's an eight session nicotine cessation support group for high school and middle school students. And what we're finding is some of these kids get to the point where they're vaping what would be the equivalent of two packs of cigarettes a day, so going through about two pods a day and it's difficult for them to know how much they're ingesting. As a cigarette smoker, you know, you know exactly how much you smoke in a day. You're a 10 cigarette a day smoker, you're a pack a day smoker, as you can see. With the vapes, you turn on, on, off, all throughout the day. It's really challenging to be able to tell. So, um, and some of these resources are ones that Lindsay pointed to, and I don't expect everyone to be jotting stuff down. You can take screenshots, or all of this information is in handouts for you guys. Um, it's some really good stuff. If you're just looking for more um, information to educate yourself, the Surgeon General's report is really good. The FDA's Real Cost Campaign is very good. Um, the information about all the lung injury stuff, every Thursday the CDC um, updates their information about what they've been seeing. So that's a good place to go. Uh, the Truth Initiative has um, this. Uh, some of these kids like apps, right? So a lot of these supports are app-based or computer-based. So here are some things, and some of them are really good. They get kids to really understand their patterns, why they're using, what their triggers are, and then helps them with other avenues for how to deal with that. And some who are possibly vaping up to two packs a day might need the help of cessation aids as well as social support and um, online support. And just so you know, and I had some flyers out there, this is another free resource that's out there for parents and for kids. So we have um, five digital courses that Karen is launching in the next week. So you can do this at home, you can get these on the App Store or on a website. One is PrEP, so that's all about how parents can prevent substance use in their kids, you know, doing what we have control over. And there's another called Connect 5, and that is an actual five session um, course that kids that are vaping or have violated policy or whose parents are concerned about them, five courses that they can go through. And it, it's really interactive, um, very visually appealing, and it's very motivational, okay? a few more of my favorite prevention websites. The, my favorite is drugthrough.org. It's really good stuff for parents. Thank you. And I guess there is. Hi. It's kind of hard going last because I feel like I was scooped on some of my things, although we did <laughs> what we were covering and everything. Um, So I'm primarily going to focus on what we're doing in, in, with the school district um, to address this whole um, epidemic. Um, so this was presented by 
So let's get the pings data, but I think it's important to notice that um, this says in the past year, vaping among high school students has increased by 78%, but that's actually um, from 2017 to 2018 data from the FDA. But still, that's pretty recent. Um, and I guess, just a little bit, I know that in my bio, it was said that I used to do um, smoking cessation through Penn um, smoking treatment program. And it was all tobacco. It was all smoking, because this is, as we keep saying, totally new. Except what's not new is the addiction to nicotine. And so uh, I primarily worked with the addiction. And I think that, as you've just heard too, that it actually can be more addictive. Vaping can be more addictive. So part of that is because, and I've worked with a lot of students who admitted to this, they use it throughout the day. When people were smoking in high school back in the day, you had to sneak out of the school. You had to go out, out to lunch, or you had to, you know, if you smoked in the bathroom, you're probably going to get caught because it stunk. And so people are vaping, and they'll admit to vaping, like in class, between classes, and all of that. They're really good at hiding it. Um, and so the more you do something that's addictive, the more you get addicted, right? Um, so um, here it says that it's quickly delivered. Right, so nicotine, the reason why it's so addictive, and the reason why actually smoking and vaping is more addictive than any other drug besides, I think, crack cocaine, is because it's delivered so quickly to the brain. So nicotine, as soon as you inhale it, it goes right, goes right to your brain, and um, it goes right to the pleasure center of your brain and it hijacks this, the messaging system that works to tell yourself that you're safe or you're feeling good or you're feeling normal or you're feeling like yourself. And so a lot of people don't understand, the kids especially, they're like, I don't know why I'm addicted. This is like something that just tasted good and I don't understand, I don't get high from it. I don't feel like this is a real addiction, but I can't not do it because when I don't do it, I don't feel like myself. I don't feel normal, I just feel jittery, I feel off, and it's because their brain needs it. It's craving it. It needs it to feel normal. Um, and also, we talked about the gateway, the gateway thing. Yeah, I mean, in other words, it, so what nicotine does is it's priming the pathways in the brain that make the brain crave something else to feel normal. And so, down the line, if they want to try something else, like an opioid or something like that, it can more, you become more susceptible to, to needing, needing something quicker. And so that's really scary when you're thinking about the climate that we're in right now, the opioid crisis and everything. So to that end, um, a lot of school districts uh, across the country actually are realizing the need to approach the vaping issue and helping students stop and actually address the addiction, not just being punitive. Um, but I will say we were ahead of the curve a little bit because the American Lung Association has recently put out a curriculum um, for what the, the school board decided to do, but we did it before they did it, so I'm proud of that. Um, so basically, the school board changed um, the policy, which is our tobacco policy, policy 218, and what it does now is it includes a shorter suspension for students caught with vapes, um, and it includes a mandated program. Um, and it's a mandated um, cessation program, education program for students violating the tobacco and vaping policy. Um, just so you know, too, there's a separate um, policy, more severe discipline policy for if they're found vaping anything besides um, nicotine. So for, for THC and things like that, it, there's a more severe, it's more for it's the drug and alcohol policy violation, and we have something also for that with this assessment and education program for that as well. But I'm going to be focusing mostly on the nicotine um, program. School Social Work Department, we developed this nicotine intervention program, which is it's not a cessation, it's not a treatment program, it's an education-based program, um, which is derived from best practices from the American Lung Association, as well as my work that I did with the smoking treatment program, so they're all evidence-based programs. Um, and it's facilitated as four either individual or group sessions over four different weeks, and so students aren't missing too much class or anything like that, we rotate through the and it can be done in the middle school as well as the high school and by any of the social workers. And here are the goals of the program. So the curriculum really focuses on assessing the students for other behavioral risk factors because it's obviously a risky behavior, right, if they're trying um, to use these products. And we wanted to see in the beginning if the behavior is an indicator of other, other issues that maybe the students deal with. So that's part of it. Um, and then we also educate students on addiction. So, uh, we don't take the approach of using scare tactics and talking about, I mean, even though 
I think the beginning of this whole presentation was pretty scary, uh, you know, learning about the, the vaping illness, and some of the kids are freaked out about it, but I gotta be honest, they're not as freaked out about it as they were maybe a few weeks ago. They're already kind of over it. They've already continued to vape, and they're not sick. So that's, that's the adolescent brain, right? Like, it won't happen to me, it's not my issue. Um, so we don't go about it trying to scare kids um, into stopping. Um, it's more just educating them, like, this is your brain on nicotine, right? Like the old school egg ad. But it's also like, this is your brain, this is what's happening, and you think that what you're inhaling and what you're vaping is helping you deal with stress, right? Because you're getting this quick, like, hit of relief to that part of your brain every time you use it. But really, what you're doing is you're getting a spike of relief, and then it drops off, and all of a sudden you start to feel uncomfortable, and all of a sudden you start to feel bad again, and you feel bad until you can get another spike of relief. And so really, instead of being steady, like you want to be throughout the day, you're going up and down and up and down and up and down. And that, does that sound relaxing? Does that sound like it's really helping with anxiety or stress? No, it's actually stressing people out more. So we go about it using that. And you know, we use the stages of change model, so that means that some kids who are caught with vapes, do you think that they ever even admit to me in the program that they've ever even tried it? It wasn't mine. It was my friends. It was my friends. I, you know, I'll do this program because I have to. Like, okay, cool. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what vaping is doing to your friend. And let me tell you a little bit about how you can help your friend. And then that's just what we do all the time. And that's fine. You know, like, it, it, it's, that's the pre-contemplation part, right? They're not even thinking about quitting. But that doesn't mean they can't get help. It doesn't mean we can't educate and prevent a little bit. Let's say if they are telling the truth, there's prevention then. And then we also work on coping skills. Um, healthy coping strategies for students just dealing with stress in general. Who couldn't use that? Um, and I'm also in communication with the parents, so the parents get notified in the very beginning with a letter that they'll be in the program. Um, and then at the end, I'll contact the parents to provide other resources and maybe have them your way and other people's way. Um, so that's the goals. The learning objectives are listed here. Uh, the beginning, we try to identify three, they have to identify three reasons why students would vape. So that's kind of like a little trick that we do, because a lot of times I think they think people are like, why would you vape? What's wrong with you? You know, don't you see people are dying from this vaping unless don't you understand? You know, so we take the opposite approach and we're just like, yeah, why, why did you, why did you try vaping? You know, and they start saying, well, it tasted good, it kind of tasted like juice, and you know, I didn't, I wanted to try something new, and my friends were doing it, and then you get this whole litany of, of reasons why students do it, and then it becomes a little bit more of a thing, but also it helps them realize why they might be swayed by, um, to make decisions that maybe aren't the best decisions. Um, so then, yeah, we just, again, we do the nicotine, how it affects the brain. We also talk about um, the concept of classical conditioning, so like Pavlov's dog, right? So we, they learn about their triggers throughout the day, like their bells, like Pavlov's bell. <laughs> and um, they learn about their triggers, and then they also learn about like how to kind of change the, their schedule and everything like that in order to make it so they have less triggers throughout the day. And um, we talk about nicotine uh, withdrawal, short-term and long-term symptoms, and kind of helping them deal with what they're working, what they're dealing with, and coping with that, and so that they won't have to fall back to using the vape, um, and other healthy ways of coping with stress. And you know, as 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 we always say, it's true. Partner, you know, parents are the best partners in student learning. So we're, we really want to make sure parents are involved whenever we're doing this program. Um, <laughs> so we also encourage any time a student is caught with this for the parent to talk with their pediatrician or their family physician because this has implications for their health. Um, and then give them other resources like this one I have quit now number and other things. Um, okay. It's not just my program that's going on um, in the schools. The, the, I think in a second we're going to hear a little bit about what's done in the health classes, but also this is a poster. I know it's impossible to read. It's just to give you an idea of what's up in the nurse's office. There is um, the truth about vaping. So every time people go to the nurse's office, they see this poster about vaping. And I've heard that it's really helped a lot of conversations that people have had with the nurse. You know, oh, so tell me more about that. Can you tell me more about, you know, and so our nurse Allison will be talking to the, the students a little bit more about vaping and giving them resources that way. So we're trying to take a, a bigger approach. Um, we also were thinking, we're hoping, and I would love, in the ideal world, I'd be able to offer this program to students who don't get caught, to people who just might want to quit. But it's really hard um, balancing privacy and other things like that in the school environment. So often, um, they want to be preferred out um, for like that. So, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
Hi, I'm John Nolan. I'm the assistant superintendent. Drew Moisture, our health teacher from the high school, wasn't able to come today. He, uh, we have a fabulous group of teachers, uh, as I think all of you know. And, and Drew has been a real leader in smoking cessation through the years. He teaches the ninth grade wellness course and then the eleventh grade uh, health and wellness course as well. And our health teachers have really pivoted quite quickly and, and jumped on this. And I know you are coming to speak to our seventh grade students, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. yeah we'll this finish year, finish up next week. We'll finish up next yeah. week, and so that just shows that uh, here in the middle school, our health teachers have reached out uh, to get the help that they need in regards to making sure that our students have the facts. Um, in in the middle school, they address this issue in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Students go twice a cycle, two out of six days in health class. Obviously, they cover a lot of topics, but certainly addiction, smoking, etc., is, is one of the key topics that they hit on every year. It's actually addressed in fifth grade as well. Again, fifth grade, you have to be a little more careful, right, when you talk about um, smoking and, and alcohol use, etc., with, with children in elementary school. But we do try to hit it head on and make sure that they understand some of the dangers involved with these types of risky behaviors. Um, and then in ninth grade, I know Drew and his team have quite an in-depth unit on smoking and, and vaping. So we know the kids are, are getting the information, um, and as many of you have said here, um, you know, in spite of that, <laughs> students are still still using this. I know Sarah, you've been pretty busy. <coughs> excuse me, this year uh, with a lot of students who have uh, now been required to take the cessation uh, educational course. Um, and it's interesting, uh, just for a little bit of a perspective, up until uh, about a year ago, our policy was such that if you were caught smoking or vaping, you were suspended for three days. Um, certainly we would talk to the student and that sort of thing, but that was it. Um, and through a pretty long process of modifying our, our uh, student code of conduct, and not just with this, but in other areas as well, we really tried to have uh, a little bit more of education rather than punishment. Uh, and I, and I feel like it's, it's got to be a good thing, right? That now a student who, whether they will admit it or not, uh, who is struggling with this, or maybe they're just trying, you know, maybe we were lucky and caught them when they were just trying it the first or second time. Now they have to work uh, and hopefully ultimately want to work with Sarah or another social worker uh, and kind of look at, at what's going on in their lives. I think that parent communication is really critical as well. I know last year here at the middle school um, and visiting a health class or two and walking around in the, uh, in the building quite a bit, there were several, um, probably 50 to 100 different posters that students designed about the, the dangers of vaping. Um, you know, they're getting the information. Uh, our teachers are really trying to interact with them in engaging ways, bringing in experts. Our social workers are engaged. Uh, we have, we're having nights like this. I, I am hopeful that we can turn the tide. You know, when I went to school and um, way back when, um, there actually were smoking rooms uh, or areas where you could smoke way back in the early 70s. Uh, it's just amazing to me that that even existed. I didn't smoke, but I certainly had friends who did. Um, and through the years, you know, we pretty much, and, and I'll look to the experts here, we almost eradicated smoking in youth, close, right? And the PACE surveys through the years do, do show that. Um, now everything's you know, with vaping. And I, and I really think through the hard work that many of you are doing here, uh, and then with our health class and our teachers and certainly parents, we, we, we can turn that tide. And we can, we can get on top of this um, basically public health crisis uh, and, and help our kids. And, and just in working with folks uh, from these agencies and our social workers, I mean, my view of it has really changed. A couple of years ago, um, you know, they're breaking the rules. So that's, they need to be punished. You know, they're breaking the rules. And then one day, talking with, I can't think of the name of the minute, but who came out originally from the organization, it'll come to me. Um, she explained, just like you said, that a student can't sit in class for 42 minutes, 45 minutes, uh, without starting to feel some withdrawal. And so, it, yeah, they are very girls, but on the other hand, they've got an addiction. And that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole different way of thinking about it. So anyway, we, um, we're hitting it hard. Um, we certainly, there's more we can do. Our health and PE uh, department, we have a curriculum cycle every five years. We look really in depth at what we're doing in each of our areas. 
that's next year for them. I know they'll be talking a lot about this, uh, but this is not something that waits for a curriculum cycle. Uh, this is something that you know that we, we jump on immediately, our teachers jump on immediately, and certainly we, we are learning. Uh, I know our principals have had um, trainings and, and for the whole faculty at the high school and middle school about vaping, passing around you know, examples of what it looks like. So uh, we've got a lot to learn. I know the kids are ahead of us, uh, but, but we're certainly um, doing our best and we need to continue to, to try to do more. And, um, thank you all for, for having us tonight.